We're here with Frank Hood, retired Navy veteran, submariner, submariner. Sorry, as I were. I'll uh, I'll I'll go down. I'll do push-ups after this to, uh, to correct. <laughs> Actually, my... sub submariner is more correct. That's yes. <laughs> is it really? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we don't we don't uh, submariner. We don't like that connotation. You know. <laughs> oh well, then then That's as I were as I were back again to where I originally <laughs> said. Hey. Uh, uh, thanks for making time for us. You, you uh, I, I know you've had a, a heck of a career, uh, but uh, when you when you were first referred to me and said, "Hey, I got another guy who's another submariner," uh, and uh, we'd love to have him on the podcast, and I was like, "Sure." I was like, "You know, what, what's the story?" He's always retired from the Navy, and uh, I thought, "Oh, okay." And then they said, "Oh, he's also written seven books." And then you emailed me and said, "Yeah, I came in in 1966." And I thought, oh, man, where we can go with the stories just about what submarine warfare was, you know, in, in the 60s and uh, in the early stages of the Cold War. So uh, before we get into any of that, uh, which I think is just fascinating, and I told you over email that I read uh, when I was in high school, I read the book Blind Man's Bluff, and yes. I was just fascinated by submarine warfare from there on out. Uh, yeah, that book... Um... Actually, you know, when we when we joined uh, the submarine force, we each signed a 75-year non-disclosure agreement. Uh, so the, some of the things that were revealed in that book had our, us raising our eyebrows. And, yeah. <laughs> what did I this was going to say, yeah. A lot yeah. of the stuff that came yeah. out from the uh, – yeah. yeah. Was uh, less than 75 years. <laughs> That's exactly right. Exactly. So uh, – but, you know, it's out there now in public domain. So there's some it, – it's very um, – Typical of, of uh, all the things we did. So, uh, so take me back a little bit. Like, first of all, I, I know if you can give us just a, a summary. Uh, I know you've written a number of books. You spent a whole separate career at, at Hewlett Packard. You did a variety of things, but just kind of walk us through uh, just sort of the highlights, if you can. Sure, John. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I was born into a family of six, and um, we lived in uh, Indiana, <clears throat> and my older brother. And had um, applied for and gotten an NROTC scholarship to Purdue. And he studied, uh, you know, for four years there. He graduated in 1960, and he was what we call a skimmer. He was on the surface fleet. Uh, he was on destroyers. He was on the WASP out of Boston. He was a navigator. Um, he was, uh, you know, a division officer. The Navy selected him. He went to uh, DLI, Defense Language Institute in Monterey, and studied Mandarin Chinese, and he went to the NSA. So that was my model. He was about 10 years older than I was. Um, subsequently to that, um, in 1964, actually, I applied for an NROTC scholarship, and it was one of the, I was very fortunate. I got it. I got a full ride to Purdue. <clears throat> they wanted me to study engineering, so I studied electrical engineering. Uh, in 1968, in the spring of 1968, I volunteered for the submarine service after having spent my uh, senior cruise between the junior and senior year on a World War II submarine out of Newport. And the total, wow. the total uh, camaraderie and the closeness and the just the uh, the spirit of that whole crew just struck me from the very beginning. And I, I thought, man, that's all I want to do. That's where I want to be. So I volunteered for submarine service. I had to go through Rickover. I had an uh, interview with Rickover. Uh, and then uh, was out, I was commissioned. Uh, I went to Bear Island for nuclear power school. That was six months. And I went to Idaho for prototype training. And that's like a, a model, a mock-up of the engineering half of a submarine inside a building. And you had to learn how to start the reactor, operate the reactor with all kinds of drills reactor scrams, et cetera. It you makes sense because right. Idaho, you know, because of all of their shoreline that they have, it makes sense. All the shoreline, exactly, yeah. And so everybody said, you're in the Navy and you're in Idaho? <laughs> so with the famous thing out there was a the jackalope. It was a um, combination between a jackrabbit and an antelope. And uh, you see it depicted in postcards with the big, huge rabbits with antelope ears coming, you know, antelope yeah. horns. Yeah, um, But we spent six months there and then went to sub school for, for six weeks. And then I was assigned to the USS Seahorse out of Charleston, South Carolina. And um, that was in November of 1969 when I first went aboard the Seahorse. So um, 
I stayed on board the Seahorse till July of 1972. And during that time, we made uh, what we call two northern runs and one Mediterranean run, as well as local ops in the Charleston operator. Wow. And a northern run for, in layman's terms, is uh, like the northern Adriatic or or up at where? Actually, it's up in the Barents Sea. Uh, oh, yeah. Way, way up north. And, and um, or I, I still can't talk about it. But... Um, it's going to be a boring uh, podcast, Frank. Uh, yeah, it would be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can talk about all the things day to day. That's what our books were about. Yeah. Um, when uh, my brother, youngest brother, uh, who's a physician, and he's also a wordsmith, uh, in 2016, uh, he asked me, he kept asking me for years to tell him stories. And I said, I can't, you know, I really can't. And he said, well, tell me something that's not classified. So I told him a few of the, you know, the pranks and the, the funny stories. And after he was through laughing, he, he got up and said, this has to be written down. And I said, why? Nobody cares. Nobody knew we were there. We were the silent service. You know, we were invisible. Um, we, we did our thing. Nobody knew we were there. Uh, and it's 50 years ago now. So uh, he said, no, if you don't write this down, this is going to be lost. So I, it took a year to think about it. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I started dictating kind of a chronology of what happened, all non-classified stuff. Yeah. And uh, the first book, which is called Poopy Suits and Cowboy Boots, there's Poopy Suits and Cowboy Boots. That's basically my story. And um, you can see it's a pretty thick book. It's got all kinds of maps and and photographs and all kinds of things in it. Um, That came out in January of 2018. And... We thought, well, we might sell 50 books. Somebody, somebody, my family will buy 50 books, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But we hit a nerve. We hit a real nerve. Um, we started a Facebook page by the same name, the same time. Uh, what, what was the, what's the genesis behind the name? Well, uh, well, we, we wore a, what was a poopy suit. If you saw Hunt for Red October. A lot of people have that blue kind of like a flight suit. It's a navy blue flight suit, but it's Velcro, and you can jump in it real quick and get going. And the same thing with cowboy boots. You didn't have to stop and tie. You didn't have to worry about your shoelace getting caught on, you know, the deck, uh, some of the the deck that had the grating and, you know, causing a trip or worse. And uh, you could just jump in your poopy suit, jump in your cowboy boots, and off you went. Okay. So um, that is what we wore, and um, we were thinking of different names, but uh, my brother Charles was out walking his dog one day, and he said, it came to me, this this has to be the title. <laughs> so uh, any submarine vet that saw that knew right away what it was about. Um, and, um, you know, initially we had a huge response from other submarine vets and from the public at large. Uh, our Our Facebook page... Uh, at, at one point, I had over 2,200 stories of wow. all things submarine. But Facebook cut us off as of 1 September last year from everything before that. I just deleted it. Oh. So we have we have a lot of stories since then. Um, but the the reviews, um, and when, when I'd say it hit a nerve, uh, other submarine vets said, hey, that's a great story, but when do you hear my story? So they started submitting to both Charles and I, um, you know, outlines of what they had done. And um, so we arranged interviews. We talked to them. Uh, Charles was a wordsmith. He, um, you know, made it a lot more readable. We both did research to add context in terms of the, you know, the cultural events that were going on and the geopolitical events at the time. And uh, we melded all that together into these books of stories. So um, as of now, we have seven books. Uh, I think we've passed, we've, we've already passed 14,800 books sold. Wow. The, uh, the first, our first um, mission, our first um, uh, goal was to d- donate the first $50,000 of the proceeds to the Submarine Veterans Scholarship Fund. And we've done that. We, we started in January of 2018. And we reached our goal in May of last year. Wow. So congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, you know, we're contributing to the next generation 
uh, helping them get scholarships in. Um, uh, and we, we've hoped we've, you know, our real second objective was to write these for for the memories of submarine veterans. And so many of them have said this is very, you know, brought back all these memories I'd totally forgotten. But to educate the public on, on the silent service on, uh, you know, as you well know, as a Navy SEAL, the sacrifice that's required, you know, the, the sacrifice on the family's part, the long times you're away from home, um, you know, the, uh, the the intense pressure of living in a, in a tube designed to sink and anything can happen <laughs> 24 seven. Okay. Uh, so you, you're always sleeping with one eye open and one ear open, you know, and um, it, it's um, it, it, that kind of pressure kind of molds you to a different person. What, I really want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about that because uh, let me let me give you some context. My my kids uh, they watch a lot of YouTube videos and they're really into these like infographic shows and the, and the things that just provide you know information on on the most abstract concepts about you know about what what universe is next door and about the the evolution of. Chinese military uniform, just like the most abstract concepts. And they were watching one recently about the submarine service. And I said, hey, I know just a little bit about it. Having spent my time in the SEAL delivery vehicle uh, team, I know just, just enough to be dangerous or just enough to know that I know very little. And, and I said, we can see, I said, there are kids, and I was telling my kids, I said, there are stealth aircraft that can be like almost undetectable by by radar. Uh, we have satellites that can, you know, be, you know, dozens of miles into the atmosphere, into the air, and they can still read a newspaper. There, there are some very, very cool uh, technological capabilities out there. I said, however, the one, you know, the one universal truth about warfare is that, in, in my mind, anyway, it's what I said to my kids is. We, you know, our enemies can see where our satellites are and they know what they're looking at. Uh, a, a jet that's, uh, you know, that is uh, radar resistant is can still be detected, you know, with certain technology or certain radars, I said. But the submarine service, that is the one like final frontier of the ultimate in clandestine warfare. And uh, and I'd love to hear some of your takes. I I. I my my later question, I want to ask you, and I'm going to just tell you where I want to go is I want to know what you think people don't know about the submarine service. And I and I want to come back to I bet you there's a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, you watch Hunt for Red October or something like that, and they go, Oh, that's cool. And you're like, no, that doesn't even scratch the surface about where we went. So before we get into that, uh, I want to go back and just like tell me about the submarine service, the stories you got when you came in, like in the in the mid '60s, the 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 Vietnam Wars, uh, you know, on its tail end, and by the late '60s. But you're on the East Coast, and you're going up to Barrett Strait. Uh, did you know, like, by the time you went on your first deployment, did you know, like, the with, with the gravity of the of what your mission was? It was that was that clear to you guys on on board? No. Um... You know, as you know, John, it's a need to know on on, um, on any kind of classified information. Um, all of us officers on board had to be uh, in the system, which is above top secret. And, um, you know, the usual, uh, just like in the World War II movies, when they, when they get underway and you're on your way to your mission, the, the captain reveals where you're going and what the mission is. So that was the same for us. Um However, we had uh, we had time between these major missions off the East Coast because the Russians had their boomers, their satellite carrying submarines, right off our East Coast constantly. So we trailed them quite a bit, and our mission was if we heard a missile door open, we were going to put a fish into them before they ever had a chance to even think twice about it. Okay. And I'm going to translate that for those who don't know. We're going to put a fish into them. It means we're going to sink them with a torpedo. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The lingo. Yeah. No, yeah, I so, love it. Yeah. We're going to put a so fish we, into them. Uh, that's, we trailed that's... them quite a bit, and and they were noisy as all. I can tell you, John, they were noisy as all get out. They, you could hear their toilets flush. You could hear their movies. You could hear a wrench drop. Really? Uh, they they were easy to track. Um. And and I and there, there's so much, and we could spend an hour just talking about that. But 
I want to go back with a couple things is you go out on deployment, you know, you, 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 you kiss your honey goodbye and you're going out. You don't know where you're going. No. Wow. That's kind of fascinating. And, and part two that I don't know if, if, if you've watched like uh U boat or some of these other, you know, really good movies or, or read any good books about undersea warfare, uh, and you just said it almost so almost in in just in passing, which I again I think I don't know if people recognize the gravity of what of what was said. You said there were German or I'm sorry Russian uh, uh, subs just off the coast of the United States, like just trolling around, and we found them, and all we did was trail them and and just follow them where they're going. Like what what did exactly. that? As a young guy, did did that? Did that sink in? Because I, I, as a middle-aged guy, I think I'm like, man, that is like, that's some Tom Clancy level shit. Like, that's just it, wild. It is. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a good question. I've never been asked that question before. As a junior officer, um, you're hit with a whole bunch of stuff when you come on, you know, and it's sure. it makes your head swim, but you can't reveal that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have to, you have to be, you know, uh, just have to be yourself, but you have to you have to be very um, uh, nonchalant, uh, you know, nonchalant about things. You can't show you're yeah. afraid. You can't show what's going on. Yeah. So um, being in the control room uh, up front, I was on the, the NAF plot where we plotted course of speed of the you know the targets and all that, and learned how to do a solution totally, um, you know, with, without any active sonar. Uh, a total non-active uh, communication or an active uh, ping, if you will, to find out where the enemy was. Okay, it was. What all, does that all, mean? A solution. <laughs> well, a solution means that's what you put in the torpedo to fire. Oh, okay. You remember uh, in uh, Captain Ramius in in Hunt for Red October? Yes. Said, Do you have a solution? Do you have a solution? Okay. The solution is the target's course and speed and range. That you oh. can put in a torpedo, and the torpedo will head that general direction and hunt for it. And so you have to find out where this guy is. Without, I mean, and for people who don't know, it's it, it, there's not like a, a windshield on the front of this submarine. No, no, look at totally, totally blind. Yeah, you're using acoustics and everything else and vibrations in in the water to figure out where this this submarine is, without letting them know that you're on their tail. Is that right? Well, we have things like we can count his screw rotation. Okay, his propeller. We can count his, um, and that tells us what his speed is. We know the class of the boat. We know uh, you can hear, uh, you know, the sonarmen are really good. They do. They have a relative bearing from the, the bow of where the sound is coming from. And uh, knowing the relative bearing and the, and the what's called the bearing rate, which means how fast does that relative bearing change in a minute? If, if a the enemy sub is way out, that change is very small, the relative bearing. If it's real close, it changes real quickly. Okay. So the bearing rate and um, the speed kind of tell you the combination of the range and the course. Okay. And if you plot a couple of points, you can get his course if he's going, you know, 030 or 050, whatever it is. Okay. And you get um, the thing that's difficult. We explain this in the first book. We explain a lot of the functions and the way things work on a submarine, on a nuclear submarine. And this targeting, the um, way we target it and figured a solution occurred back from the 20s and 30s. And it was used essentially in World War II. They had a mechanical computer on board called a TDS, uh, a target data system. And you could feed, of course, they used a periscope back then. And they would get a, a range uh, with the reticles. They would get an angle on the bow that you could see. And they would get a, uh, the approximate range, and you would track that. And the the mechanical computer actually was so sophisticated, it actually came up with a solution. And uh, as long as that matched what the plotter was doing, then you were pretty close to the you know to the right answer. So uh, we didn't things hadn't changed that much in the nuclear submarine area. We still use that same technology, although our sonar is obviously much more sophisticated. And our, um, you know, the other, the analysis stuff was was computer driven. So we could tell what class of boat it was from the, the noise, the screw turns, et cetera. In, in the movies, they give you the impression that when you're following a submarine, that you're, you're a hundred yards off of them. And that like, you know, and that, and you could almost have like a brush with them if you, if you didn't. 
uh is that is that true when you say you're following them are you guys like miles away or are you, are no, you no, no, close? We're very, very close uh, in the brushes did occur um really yes um, i assume this was all just hollywood nonsense no you're, no you're no that close you remember the crazy ivan in the movie yeah yeah okay, that's when the, the submarine skipper turns to bow on so you don't he has you have a bow no in the sonar you can't hear the noise from the screw so um and all of a sudden, you know, we were always a little bit different depth than they were. Okay. So that gave us a little safety margin. Okay. But sometimes those nuts, some of those uh, Russian skippers were crazy. They would actually dive down towards us. And um, just suspecting that you're behind them. Yeah. So whatever you had a crazy eye, even there was some tight rear ends in, in every, you know, in the control room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just wait, waiting for things to, to uh, resolve themselves, okay? And, uh, you know, think we came close a couple of times because you could hear, you know, you can hear it right through the hall. <clears throat> you, can, so, you can hear what? The screw. Wow. So you're passing by them within yards, dozens of yards. Probably, yeah, within within 50 yards, within 40 yards sometimes. And, and we're and just for, for context, for anybody who doesn't know anything about submarine warfare, we're not talking about a submarine that's, uh that that's 50 feet long we're talking about a oh. submarine that's giant our our boat was as long as a football field and so to pass within 50 yards is might as well be able to reach out and touch almost them. like reaching out and touching them yep yep that's that's yep. nuts so, yeah yeah so uh that was a pretty common occurrence when we were in our op areas what was it was it super was the tension like just could you cut it with a knife when you're in a boat, when you are, when I say boat, when it's submarine and you are on the tail of another, because when you're on the tail of another submarine, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not on their tail for like eight hours. And then you're like, all right, have a great day. You're, you're chasing these guys for, for days or weeks, right? Days. days. Yes. Yes. And um, yeah, on a crazy eye, the tension got a little, little tight, but otherwise it was just part of your job. You just went about the business, you know, you learn, how to do it, and you did it. And uh, it was a very um, strong reliance, as you can imagine, on, on the officer of the deck, the guy in charge. You know, yeah. and that's why that's why it's so difficult to earn the dolphins. Uh, uh, it takes years to earn dolphins as an officer. You got to be super qualified to know exactly what to do in every situation. Sure, and, and dolphins yeah. for the for the layman are the 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 pin, the warfare pin, but the pin that you earn to certify that you can now stand on when the, when the captain's sleeping, you can yes. now be the guy in charge and make decisions like when it's time to wake up the captain. Cause we have our guy pull a crazy Ivan or something. Exactly. Well, the captain slept through most of those, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, that was, that was a pretty common occurrence back in those days. That's, that's absolutely insane. I mean, just, just again, we're doing, we're, I know we're only scratching the surface and this is, you said at the beginning, you said Russians, uh, the, they were very loud, very noisy, and that was the old yes. class. I know the Akula class, and again, I'm not like a submarine expert, but I know the Akula class came a long way. Um, in your estimation, without, well, I don't know, I don't know what you can reveal, what you can't, uh, it, are we still a much more formidable force under the water, or is or are the Russians it's the... Lot, it's, it's a lot more equal now, John. Is it um, the Chinese as well? Technology and Chinese are very good boats. Um, it's, we don't have the distinct advantage we once had. Okay. Um, we still have an advantage in, uh, we think we have better people, better tactics, yeah. um, some better technology, uh, but it's, it's, it's close. Yeah. Is that, uh, I, I started out and I said, you know, I was telling my kids about how, submarine warfare is the the last of the true clandestine uh warfare arenas do you agree with that yes i do yes um uh, you know the the uh, back in the 50s when they developed the mutually assured destruction yeah uh, uh to strategy basically and Since they had when they started had, carrying uh when they started carrying nukes on subs right yeah well they had the, they had the you know they had the bombers Yep. They what used to be called um, uh, SAC, Strategic Air Command. Okay, then they had the Mikey missile silos all over the country, and they had the fleet ballistic missile submarines. We called the Boomers for short. Yep. They carry the uh, back then it was a Trident uh, missiles. It started out with Polaris and it went to Trident, and um, those were the three 
plagues of what was called the nuclear mutually, mutually assured destruction triad that, that kept the world safe from nuclear warfare. So uh, of those three, the, you know, the Pentagon always knew that the uh, su nuclear submarines were absolutely the, the, uh, the most un, you know, un unknown quantity in an equation. If somebody wants to attack, where are they? They don't know. Yeah. Right. It, we, we the Russians and, and our adversaries know where our silos are for, in like on land or and and exactly. vice versa. <clears throat> exactly. So yeah, it's still true. It's still true. As a matter of fact, um, as you probably know, you know the uh, each model or each class of submarines evolved quickly. It started in the 1950s when Rickover was really pushing for nuclear power, and then. Uh, Things like the Albacore, the USS Albacore, where they had the bulbous bow instead of the knife point, like the fleet boats of World War II, where you could really glide. As a matter of fact, our, our submarine was actually like an airplane. Our skipper, you like to fly in the ocean. And uh, we, we would be asleep at night, and he would be what we call angles and dangles. He would go up and down, and when he you know, did a hard bank, it would tilt over like an airplane. And, um, you know, much of the detriment of people trying to sleep, you know, when you had the few hours of sleep you could catch. <laughs> because when you went on watch, you were qualifying. You were you were learning, and sure. um, you know basically, um, uh, officers weren't expected to know details like the enlisted men were. You know there was they were experts. Yeah, on, on individual systems, we we had the bigger picture of, of the, how to deploy everything. You know together as a as a group. Um, and uh but you still had to you know one time we were um pretty deep and uh in in the control room you know the the planes that were on the sides of the sail yeah in the stern planes in the back they control the angle of the boat and um one uh, they had three thousand pound hydraulic okay what, what might be like the rudders on a uh or not the rudder the yeah, like the ailerons rudder, on an airplane an airplane you know like yeah. rudder and airlines exactly yeah so there was these. Uh, there was this valve nest outboard on the starboard side that had about uh, maybe ten or eleven uh, ball valves of high high pressure, you know, three thousand pound hydraulics. Well, one day we were deep, and one of those things leaked. And when it leaked, it leaked massively because three thousand pounds pressure, yeah. and it was spraying. It was a mist all of a sudden in the control control room. You couldn't see, and uh, one of the the, the uh, junior officers on board. He was on the nav table. He jumped over the table, which is about four feet tall, went right over to one valve, closed it, and stopped it with him like three seconds. But just in that three seconds, enough hydraulic fluid had escaped because we were we were going up. It ran down the deck plates, leaked down, and leaked all the way down to the to the bottom level of the, the torpedo room, and it was sitting everywhere. So we had to spend a whole week cleaning what's called field day, and we had to get two brushes <laughs> out. In some areas to clean to clean the oil out of these places, you know, with a slob and toothbrush, and um, so that's the kind of stuff that can happen quickly and unexpectedly. But you have to be able to re respond, and that's uh, that's what qualifying is all about. It's knowing that, in in, in a lot of sense, um, you depend on your brother. When you're asleep, the guy that's on watch, you know that he knows what he's doing. It, there's, I want to go back to one of the the things I opened up with was. What don't people know about submarines or life on submarines? And I, and I want to use a couple of things you just said, and I want to open the floor to you to kind of just, just shed some light on a guy who spent a whole career in there. Um, but you said, uh, well, because we were up in the, uh, in the, the like the, wait, I'm sorry, what's the name of the, like the, the, where the, where all the hub of activities control, is it the control room? Yeah, control room. Yes. So you said this hydraulic fluid leaked and it went down several levels. I don't think people understand that a submarine is just a big tube and it's not like the floors. It's not like your solid hardwood floors. It, it's There's a lot of open gaps where if something leaks up in the control room, it leaks all the way through multiple levels down. All the way down uh, into, the bottom of, the, of, the, of that particular compartment. Of course, the compartments are watertight. You know, there's a bulkhead. Yeah. Uh, a pressure bulkhead, and uh, we had uh, eight compartments in our boat, and they were all, uh, you know, you got through a watertight door with what's called dogs. Yeah. You've seen them turn the wheel, you know, and, and secure the door. Um, and um, we usually kept those those door doors are between compartments and hatches are going topside, going above. 
So we kept the watertight doors uh, open unless we're, we were rigging for <laughs> some activity. Yeah. Or, or you know, uh, if there was flooding, then we immediately dogged the doors and flooded, you know, so isolated the compartments. So in the ops compartment, um, which is uh, the very top level was control, and it had the CO and XO stateroom, the radio room, uh, the ECM room, the sonar shack, they had the fan room for all the fans for the air conditioning. Then we had the middle middle level, which was um, the cruise mess and the wardroom uh, and uh, some of the chiefs. And uh, it was more like birthing and, and, and meals and storage. And the bottom level was the torpedo room. <clears throat> so... Uh, when this hydraulically occurred, it, it went, and the, what, what happens is they put these metal guide rails, almost like a drop ceiling. You can imagine that, okay? Yeah. They, in, in the control room, we had a faux wood, you know, a fake wood floor. But on the other levels, like especially in the, in the torpedo room, it was like great. It was grating. So, um, you know, it would, it, there was, the panels were about three feet long. So, uh, and they, you know, there was some play there. They weren't super tight. So if something did leak, it would find its way down through all that. You, uh, the other thing is I, I don't want to tee up is unlike a ship where you deploy and you're out at sea and you can see the sun rise and the sun fall and, and you might be, you might be lonely out in the middle of the Atlantic, but, uh, or Pacific, but, uh, you're going to pull into port. With submarine warfare, and I don't think this is what the, the average person knows, is you go under, and it's, it's probably something people recognize. They've never stopped to think about it. You, you might not see the sun for for 90 days, like you, and you lose track of time, your whole circadian clock, and uh, it, it gets turned upside down. You don't know if it's day or night. You're just working. You work on, you work, you know, you go to sleep. You work, you, you go back to sleep. Uh, tell us, like, a little bit about what people don't know, and I, and I just use that as one small... Okay. Like, that's a very good, uh, point. Well, we left harbor. We left the harbor, Charleston Harbor, on the surface, yeah. and you navigate down the the channel, and you get to what's called the hundred hundred fathom curve, and you and you dive, and you don't come up again until you hit the hundred fathom curve somewhere else. The longest period I was underwater was one hundred and thirty seven days in a row, with with ne and never saw the sun. We saw the sun. Never, wow. Yeah. Uh, when we go down. Uh, we immediately changed the clock to Zulu time, which means Greenwich Mean Time. Yeah. So we could leave Charleston at 10 o'clock, hit the sea buoy at uh, noon. Uh, we, we dive. All of a sudden, it's 5 o'clock, and it's dinner time. So it, it, that change in schedule, you had to get used to that, too, you know, that adjustment to time. Uh, 137 days. Like, I, I want to put – that. that is – what, that's four and a half months? Yep, four and a half that's, months. Yes. Like for now, people listening, start the clock today and think yes. of, and, and put a, a spot on the calendar for four and a half months from now and think about what if you only saw the same guys, the same small crew, you worked in the same space, you never left your house and essentially your hallway in your bedroom, and you didn't see the sun. Like that's just the sun. And we, didn't, we didn't have any surreal. communications from, from anybody, from home or anything. Yeah. You know, when we, we were out at uh, sea every six hours, we came to Periscope Death and we copied the radio messages that was for us, you know. They were all encrypted. And if we were lucky, the captain let us stay up and get scores at the very end. <laughs> it was, it was two hour, a two-hour window. So as you can tell, you know, as you know, a lot of interest in football scores during the football season. Uh, but we made our own oxygen. We scrubbed our own CO2. We were basically self-contained. And uh, the problem was that the CO2 level, as you mentioned, that got, uh, I think, 14 or 15 times higher than normal at a steady state level because the, the scrubber just couldn't keep up because you have, you know, people, people were smoking back then, you had human <laughs> body odor, you had cooking, you know, uh, odors and, you know, it just built up in the boat and you had this Wolverine headache. It would go across your forehead and down the middle of your, your head. And he had it all the time and uh, just, really? you just learned to live with it. So it, it started appearing maybe six, seven days out. And the other thing is, you know, all the fresh food and stuff goes, you know. And I, I always tell people, you've never lived till you've had scrambled eggs made with with uh, egg powder and egg, and powdered milk. <laughs> I didn't even think about somewhere that. in there, you're going to eat into nothing but powder, you know. 
so, but we had, you know, we had good food. We, the Navy gave us the best food. Um, and we, you know, just like the SEAL team, I mean, you, you had this camaraderie. We were, we were all a team. Everybody had their job to do. Uh, everybody did their job very well. Um, and, you know, we, we just did our job. You know, people say, well, how can you stay underwater for all that time? So you had a job to do. You just did your job. Okay. You didn't even think about it. It was just what you volunteered for and what you're there and you just do, you do your job. So I can tell you though, when we come back and you open that hatch, man, it's great to see some fresh air, some sun. You get in, you take a long shower, you know, you just stay in that shower for 20 minutes, <laughs> you know, cause you had to take uh, the, the proverbial submarine shower underway, you know, that is, uh, I suspect, I don't, I've never been, I've never been without darkness for 137 days. I don't know, but I suspect that makes you appreciate little things. It like, does. Like, it really does. Like, everything else becomes a first world problem. You're like, listen, I actually can see the sun and, uh, <laughs> and I'm not working 16 hour days, seven days yeah, but, a week. Well, you know, in, in, in the ops department on the upper level control room and then the middle level and in the birding areas, we rig for red at uh, sunset local time. Okay. So uh, even though the clock was on Zulu, depending on where you were, the sunset was different different times. Okay. But yeah. As soon as we had official sunset, you rigged for red. And when you went to Periscope depth at night, you actually rigged for black. You turned everything off so your eyes could adjust. And one of the things you had to do as an officer of the deck is when you when you break the, uh, you, you, you raise the scope at about 100 feet, there's a ring and it comes up and you get your eye in the eyepiece and you're rotating around and you can see in the daylight, you can see the water so light. You can see it coming, you know, coming up, coming up. You break the surface. The first thing you do is you look for any surface contacts. Then you rotate the mirror up and look for any aerial contact. Okay. Okay. And uh, more than once, we were surprised by ships being very close in our, uh, in our, because of a thermocline and lots, lots of different reasons of physics. We didn't yeah. get to hear the sound, you know. So uh, you do what's called emergency deep. Which means you, uh, you know, you you increase the speed. You, you put full dive on the planes and get out of dodge as quick as you can. Yeah. And nowadays, on the modern boats, they have a push button for that. And uh, I don't. I, uh, these kids, these kids and their know, newfangled toys. Newfangled toys. You know, you say, "Hey, emergency deep." Okay, push the button. The planes go down, and you way you go. You know, so. Um, yeah, that's that's one thing I think people don't realize that, that you're totally isolated. You have no news from home, nothing. You don't talk, you, nothing about what's going on with your family, or yeah. you know, um, you don't really know any world news. You just know what's going on. Uh, you know, like one time we were we were in the Med, and we had we were in Spain, and we had to got orders to get underway because there was an Israeli Arab dust up, and was on the verge of war. It never happened. Nobody's people don't know about it. But we steam heavy knots means high speed over to the eastern Mediterranean to get in position. Wow. And um, before we got there, they called the, the uh, went to DEFCON 2, if you're familiar, you know, familiar with that. Yeah. And uh, we were DEFCON 3 normally. It means defense condition. Defense condition 3 is a normal state of just being ready to for anything. DEFCON 2 means on the verge of war. DEFCON 1 is actual war. So, um we were DEFCON 2, and uh, we we got over there pretty quickly, and then we turned around and came back. <laughs> so that was that was interesting. Yeah, that, that'll get your pucker factor up. It will. It really will. Yeah, I mean, we were laying out charts, and we, we had battle planes, everything, you know. So when you talk about, like, nuclear deterrence factor, and for, for, for a lot of folks, whether you're in the military or not, that's – we understand that – that the whole concept of mutually assured destruction is it's what kept the world safe. Essentially it said that as soon as Russia launches their nukes, so does the United States. And it's that exactly that mutually assured destruction. And that's what kept nuclear war from happening is that both mm -hmm. sides knew as soon as one started it, the other one was going to finish it and it was going to be just, just an obliteration of the world. So when you guys go and you're underway and you're moving pretty quickly to a place and you're going to DEF CON too, like what, what's what's the feeling like on the ship? Is it is it all business? Is it is it still the great camaraderie, or is it just is it nerves and anxiety and and just sort of what what do you and and as a, as an officer, how do you help people deal with it? Well, uh, there's a heightened awareness. Yeah, 
of of the importance of what you're doing. Wow. It's just not. It's just not. Uh, you know, every day, like you said, you go, go on watch, qualify. You go on watch. You eat. You sleep a little bit. Get up. Do the same thing. Repeat and rinse. You know. Yeah. Um, there's a heightened awareness that we may have to really put our skills to to the sharp point at, at some point here. Yeah. So uh, I, I wouldn't say there was any high anxiety. I mean, you know, we train for that. But, but submarine force is very, very highly trained. Sure. And we're in the Charleston op areas. Not only are we trailing Russian submarines, but we're doing all kinds of drills all the time. Uh, you know, fire on board, uh, nuclear spill, reactor scram, leak, you name it. Uh, there's just drill after drill after drill. And and there's a reason for that. First of all, it, it keeps the crew very on edge. So just like anything else, you don't have to think about it. You just react when something happens. And, you know, and that reaction, especially with a leak, can make a difference between making it or not making it. You can get it stopped. So that that's uh, the kind of thing that enables a, a young officer to dive over the four foot table and hit the valve to to shut down the. And exactly. I said that half, half kiddingly, but not half not like that is his reaction. I assume was some reflection of it. Just that wasn't his first time seeing a no. that kind of scenario. No, it wasn't. As a matter of fact, uh, this officer he was an ensign, but before that he was a list of man. He was on the PBR boats in Vietnam. Wow. And he had actually gotten a silver star because when they were in a firefight on the river and one of his men got hit and um, he dove in under fire, and got the man and dragged him up back on board. Wow. Uh, and it actually saved his life. So this guy was, uh, you know, a very seasoned uh, veteran at the time, even though he was just an ensign. Uh, <laughs> he was, you know, everybody respected him. His name was Bill and everybody called him Wild Bill, you know. And um, just, I'm sure just like in the, in the SEALs team, everybody has a nickname, you know. Yeah. And, uh, sure. you know, so, uh, and, you know, in, in the submarine force, uh, I mean, you were in the Navy, you know how, um, especially, you know, if you get closer you get to D.C., the, uh, the traditions, the protocols, the, uh, uh, the rules get more enforced, okay? The further away you get from D.C., you know, San Diego, even further west, it's, you know, it's okay. You know, whatever, whatever is needed. And as far as Marine Force, it was very loose. That's one thing that drew it, drew it to me because um, even though I was an officer, I never thought I was any better than anybody else. I just had a job. Yeah. And my men had a job, you know, and, and together we worked to make it do the best we could on our jobs, you know. And, uh, and that kind of feeling permeated the, the submarine force pretty much throughout. And, um, so the the camaraderie between the officers and men was really close, <clears throat> and uh, you know. But when push came to shove, it was Mister Hood. You know, it was Mister. You know, yeah. Uh, and, and you you did your job. I, uh, I suspect if you're uh, if you're under the ocean for three, four months, or more than four months, I mean, you have to have that kind of camaraderie, right? You do you do you know what and and. and one of the reasons for qualification is to weed guys out that can't take that. Yeah. So, uh, and that, that happens. I mean, even if they get through sub school and they get through all the, all the other weeding out processes to be on submarines, there's still a few that don't quite cut it when they get to the fleet, you know? So we, uh, I, I could, I could talk to you for hours about just submarine warfare and just even just, just to get a, an inkling of some of the stuff you saw and did. And, and, but, we do a lot of discussion on this podcast about leadership lessons. And I know you went on to be, to have your own business for more than a decade and spent a whole career at, at, at Hewlett Packard and stuff. But I want to go back to just this last piece. And I want to, I want to close out with this. Uh, we struggle today to work through conflict. And I think organizational leaders struggle to, to help mediate conflict when you know when there's a lot of personalities and today in today's world in particular we have you know there's just it, it can be a very politically charged atmosphere whether we like it or not it is what it is yes um i suspect there's probably some lessons that you learned being confined to this is the team we have we're going underway we're going under under the under the water for four and a half months we may not love each other we may not even like each other some days but we have to work together no matter what. There, there is no, well, what if we don't? Well, we have to. 
I wonder if you can impart some some knowledge or some lessons about how you kept people focused on a task, how you worked through conflict, that kind of thing. What, what did you take from that time when you're in a confined space and there was no other option except to be focused on the mission? How, how did you guys make that work? ROGC, you take leadership as a course. It's, it's an actual course. And one of the things you learn there is a very famous phrase, you know, you praise in public and reprimand in private. So my very first week on the boat, uh, we got underway um, and there was fog. And I was the electronics material, material officer, which meant I was in charge of the radar, the radar operation. And I had one first class ET electronic technician under me. And for people that don't know, first class is like an e E6. So, um, you know, the captain called down from the bridge before we got underway. As a radar operational, I said, let me check with my, my uh, advance. I called first class. I said, is the operation, is the radar operational? Yes, sir, it is. Like, forward up to the captain. So we got underway, and just no sooner we got underway, this thick fog came in. And the only way you can navigate, you, you couldn't see any of the landmarks, you know, with, yeah. through the scope, but dead reckon. So you had to do it through the radar. It was water towers and church steeples, you know, you could pick those up. Yeah. Well, right in the middle of a very complex part of Charleston Harbor, the radar conked out. So the captain navigated through that. I mean, we had lookouts looking at buoy numbers and all that, you know, and, and uh, red right returning. And, you know, we knew <clears throat> we knew how to get through the channel, but it was very tricky because there was ebb currents, you know, was ocean was coming in. It was very tricky. Anyway, we soon no sooner got to the out to sea, the captain called me in the stateroom and chewed my, you know what, up and down. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I've only been on board a week. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so welcome. Yeah. Welcome to your uh, career. I called uh I called a first classman uh ET into my stateroom and I said, Now look, I'm not gonna get into a shouting contest with you okay you use the different words you know yeah. and um uh i just want to know what happened you told me it was operational what happened he said i don't know i said did you do your pms he said no i, I didn't do it i said why in the heck didn't you do your pms you know they're 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 preventative maintenance it's easy to do you know he yeah. said well i just figured we didn't need to do them so i told him right then and there i said look um I'm not going to get into a shouting contest with you, but your job is to make sure that thing is working. I said, if you screw up like this again, I will personally make sure you never make chief. You got it? I sign your fitness report, and I'm going to personally make sure you never make chief. So do you have any, any, any answer to that? He said, no, sir. You got it. He wouldn't talk to me like for three days, but you know what? He did make chief, and he invited me to his, his wedding down party. I personally... <laughs> Gave him a, a, a excellent uh, fitness report because he turned around and really got, you know, turned to and got to it. Um, another division I had, it was electrical division. There was three first class petty officers in that division. And they were all fighting for leadership. So that was it. It was, a, it was the worst morale the, the division on the boat where it had the worst morale. Yeah. So the captain three, gave that. Three guys team. fighting for one promotion spot. One promotion spot. So I, uh, I assessed that right away. So I called all three of them into the war room. I said, look, my job is to help all three of you guys make chief. Okay. And here's what we're going to do. You're going to take PMS for one month. You're going to take, uh, you know, uh, instruction for lower, or you petty officers for one month. I can't remember the third thing. But I said, after six months, we're going to rotate. And all three of you are going to get exposure. Okay. And if you do a good job, I will personally write you a good fitness report. So all three of them made chief. Uh, one, while I was still in, I got to go to his wedding down party. The other two after I left. But um, they, you know, they really turned to again and buckled down and did their job, you know. So the thing I think the, the bottom line of this is you treat people like people. You treat people res with respect. Uh, just because you're an officer doesn't mean you know anything. Matter of fact, you don't know anything. If you're a smart officer, you listen to your listen men who know what they're doing and you listen to what they say and you, you take that as part of your uh, calculation. Okay. You don't take everything they say, but it's part of what you take in in order to make a decision. So that really was, again, a pervasive uh, atmosphere on, on submarines. Um, 
the officers respected the men, the men respected the officers. There was a few, you know, there's always a few. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we had a guy, uh, an officer who was a NSEP, which means it was a program the Navy picked certain enlisted people and they sent them to college for four years. And it stood for Naval Enlisted Scientific Education Program. And this guy um, that came back, I think it was a sonarman. Anyway, he was a JG by the time he made, you know, got to the boat. This guy was huge. He was over 300 pounds. He was 330, 340 pounds. And he filled out his poopy suit. So the crew called him Big Blue. And for some reason, they hated Big Blue. I could never <laughs> understand that. They could, I mean, he seemed to me like a nice guy. He seemed, every time I saw him interact with people, he seemed to be respectful. But the crew just hated this guy for some reason. So uh, Big Blue had a lot of pranks pulled on him <laughs> while we were underway. That's how submariners keep their sanity. That is how you keep your sanity, right? Yes, you 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 brag on each other, and if you detect any sign of weakness, you just drill in. You know, and you, you <laughs> that's admit- probably not one of the leadership lessons we're gonna talk. Uh, no, about. no, but that's but that's, that's what happens. Okay, um, so uh, I think the the real thing is, you know, you got, there's only can be only one leader, so you can't be wishy washy. You have to be decisive. Uh, Precise. You have to be decisive, right? But at the same time, you need to respect your men and you need to take their into consideration. And I always praised uh, and praised in public, you know, when it was deserved. You know, anybody could see through a false, uh, you know, common accommodation in a New York minute. You know, you so see, you have to be genuine and you have to be true. But whenever the opportunity presented itself and my men did something well, I always made it known. And, um, you know, they always, they came up to me when they loved, no, I was leaving the boat and they all said, uh, you're one of the good ones. We were glad to have you on board. So <clears throat> that made that's, me feel, you know. That's uh, that that's all we can ask for, right? Leaving that's a legacy can behind. For. That's all we can ask for. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, leaving uh, a good legacy behind so that when people yes. tell stories and they tell their stories to their grandkids, they'll say, I had this one officer, man, he, he really took care of us. Yes. Well, you know, and in your point uh, in today's politically charged environment, it seems like people don't want to listen. They have their viewpoint and it's set and you can't convince me one way or another. Okay. And um, a leader would try to bring those two sides together and listen and, and try to find some compromise or some, some place in the middle where they could meet, you know, at least agree on something to get something done to move forward. So I think that's missing a lot today. Yeah. No, no, that's uh, that's that's a that's sage insights. Uh, hey, Bill. Uh, or sorry, Frank. Uh, this has been just, this has been great, man. I I, I could go into this all day long. Very, very insightful. Um, seven books. Are they available on Amazon? They're all on Amazon. Um, yes. And if we have a website, that we're all seven or we're all six of them. Uh, one, our webmaster's a little slow getting the seventh book on, but, um. It's called subtales.com, S-U-B-T-A-L-E-S.com. Subtales.com, all seven of, books are there. So well, six of the books are there. Okay. The seventh book is alluded to. Uh, and um, we're coming out with an eighth book, actually, this fall. Um, and it, it, the, the books have split into two genres. Okay, one is called the Subtales series, which are little-known stories that were – given to us by various people and we'd read the research and and told the stories i mean all kinds of things from slade cutter kicking the winning a field goal in the army navy game in 1935 he was the submarine skipper in world war ii to uh, all kinds of rescues at sea that you know submarines aren't great for because they're round they're not you know, you know yeah. inherently stable like a surface ship uh to um you know, sub crew in the 1920s were out of power and they rigged a sail. They took a bed sheet and rigged a sail and sailed into Pearl Harbor. And things, just ingenuity, uh, people reacting uh, instinctively in a, in a sound way, under pressure, unexpected emergencies occur, and all kinds of things. There was, there was a, uh, a, a Navy chopper from San Diego out at sea and his engine was failing and it was the only ship in the city was a submarine. So it was a World War II boat. He had a flat deck in the front and forward part of the ship, the sub surfaced and the chopper came right down onto the 
the surface of the boat just perfectly fit. No and way. At, the, at, the, at that moment, the engine totally failed. And uh, so, I mean, there's all kinds of stories like that. One of my favorite stories is a, is a guy named Joe Rosek. He was um, a guy from Chicago, volunteer for the sub sur subsurface, submarine service. His boat got uh, bombed by Japanese aircraft and sunk. He, the, the man overboard or evacuate ship, he got off. He was picked up by a Japanese carrier, and uh, they were heading to Japan for a POW camp, and a U.S. submarine sank the carrier. He survived that. <laughs> and then, through, through an amazing story, he, he went through two POW camps, and after that whole thing, he went back to Chicago and ran his business, and nobody knew a thing what he did. Joe Rosick. Joe Rosick, yep, American hero, true American hero. Yeah, you're not kidding. Yeah, that's wow. in the, that's in our second book called Subtales. Oh so man, we've got Subtales series, and we've got the Silent Service Remember series, and there's four books in that, or three books right now. These are stories written by men themselves, by other submariners. For everybody from a yeoman to a quartermaster to a sonarman to a radioman to a nuke ET to a junior officer to a captain of a submarine. There's all different levels, different viewpoints, and different scenarios, and different um, their their observation of what happened to them while they were in the in the in the navy on a submarine. And to a man, I mean, even today, I mean, I would give my right, you know, what to go go dive one more time, just to hear the boat creak, you know, and 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 to experience that one more time. Okay, of course, I'll never get to do that, but you know, spoken like a true sailor, my friend. Yeah, yeah, all of us. Uh, you know, uh, we're really attached to our boats, and uh, and, the, and the men, of course, of course, the men what made it, you know. So um, very cool. Subtails dot com. Subtails dot com. Uh, and I know you said there's a, a Facebook group. Is is it the poopy suits it's, and uh, poopy suits and cowboy boots Facebook and on Facebook group? Yes. Frank, thank you so much for spending the, the the afternoon with us, man. Really fascinating stuff. Subtails dot com. Poopy suits and cowboy boots on Facebook. Uh, we'll be sure to post that up there on uh, on our on our YouTube channel as well. Thanks again, man. Really appreciate thank your time. Thank you very much, John, for giving us the time, and thank you for all you've done for your service. Thank you for your service to your country, and thank you for what you're doing to veterans now. You thank as you well, my friend. Time.